place. For two lessons, I am um, David Kebbedo, author of Anjali, head and neck surgeon by profession from Addis Ababa University, and I will be moderating, you know, today's CMA. The topic for today will be, you know, advanced in NTK in Ethiopia with CP point of 1.5. Now, and this point you know, will be awarded you know, to, our, to give this point you now you are expected you know, to attend you know, the full session. And at the end of the session, you now we will have a survey question and the certificate you know, will be available to via email you now for those participants you know, who score you now at least you know, 50% of the question. So for today's you now, our mode of accord you know, will be the presentation will take you know, the initial 30 minutes and the next 20 to 30 minutes will be you now uh, discussion. And if you have you no know, any question or comment in the presentation, you can put it you now on the chat on the chat box, you know, which I will be you now gently checking. And if you want to you know. Or the other alternative will be, you, know, you can ask it directly to the presenter you know, at the end of the, our session. So, as already put, you know, our, for our today's session will be advancing in, in Ethiopia and and our these topics which I see you now. A major shift you know, in the past five to ten years, you know, not specifically in our country, but especially in our country, there is a major uh, shift, you know, and there is, I think, you know, there is no other person more fit than not present, you know, this uh, paradigm shift, you know, with respect to the end in Ethiopia than Dr. Masala, and Dr. Masala is a medical doctor you know, by background and also allowed to head in the next surgeon and he has also completed his head in the fellowship you now at Bakhtino you know, and currently he is you now an associate professor of autolaryngology to head in the next surgery at Absawa University. So without further ado, you know, I it's Dr. Masala can, can you can continue your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Dawit, for this uh, great chance. Uh, thank you, uh, Emma, for, uh, for this chance. I will start speaking on advances in NT care in Ethiopia. As uh, Dr. Dawit has mentioned, NT has seen uh, a significant progress in the past 10 years. Uh, generally, in the past few decades, uh, there was dramatic change in the field of otolaryngology head and neck surgery. But in the, in the past 10 years, the progress was very, very significant. Uh, as far as uh, advances in care in Ethiopia is concerned, first we have to look at the historical background of NT development generally. Uh, and we will uh, try to touch on uh, historical background of ENT in Ethiopia, how it is started and how it has developed to the current state. Uh, so uh, let's start by uh, talking, uh, by seeing the historical background of ENT development. Uh, among the disciplines which have a very rich history, ENT is the one. And it was uh, one of the first disciplines to use local anesthesia concerning uh, these procedures. Uh, there were so many procedures which have been started long time ago. And local anesthesia was started uh, at first and uh, NT was the first discipline to start uh, local anesthesia. And uh, as far as prosthesis is concerned, uh, the pioneer in starting prosthesis is also ENT to reconstruct the middle ear, which is a the transmissing uh, unit in the ear. Uh, prosthesis was used uh, first. Uh, not, not only prosthesis, uh, microscope and endoscope was first used in the discipline of uh, ENT. Um, you know, the structures which are 
being dealt in NT are very small. And to deal with pathologies, uh, there should be some form of magnification. Otherwise, we might have we might not be able to uh, to, to to address the pathologies comfortably. For that, micro, microscope was first used in uh, NT. Not only that, endoscope uh, was first uh, used in NT. Uh, you know, the structures in NT are deeply seated. Uh, if we take nasopharynx, we cannot directly inspect the nasopharynx uh, using headlight or some other means. So endoscope was uh, used first to see the sleep structures, including the larynx, nasopharynx, and paranasal sinuses. Uh, generally, there were so many changes in the scientific progresses uh, in the field. To see the uh, history of NT, it was among the disciplines which, has, which are really started very early. The Ebersis scroll from Egypt, uh, it's, it's known for its rich uh, documentation of some medical history. So in, in the Ebersis scroll, we, we see uh, the different lesions on the temporal one, especially after the, the battle, they have described the effect of uh, temporal bone lesions on hearing and speech. And it's amazing how they associate temporal bone pathology with speech and hearing. Uh, also in one of uh, the big medical documents, the Egyptian pharmacopoeia, uh, there were uh, lists of drugs which were thought to be helped in hearing or in decrement of hearing. So it says uh, medicines for hard of hearing. So the Greeks uh, were also practicing some sort of uh, this head and neck uh, area treatment. Uh, Alkmine is uh, thought to be the father of uh, neuroanatomy. Uh, he tried to describe how hearing happened and empedocles. He is the first person to describe actually uh, cochlea in his documentation. Uh, Hippocrates was also very much interested in otology, and there were some descriptions regarding hearing and how decrement of hearing comes in his records. Aristotle also created a theory of hearing, though uh, it is very far from the current uh, theory. Uh, there has been significant development over the years, but 19th century was the time where major progress in uh, autology was seen. Uh, concerning the larynx and the pharynx, uh, on, on, on Egypt documents, there has been some drawings which are thought to be uh, tracheostome. So probably people were practicing pra tracheostomy uh, earlier in the time. And in India medical documentations, uh, there were chapters describing drugs and treatments for voice disorders. And Aristotle, he was the first person to uh, describe or to mention the name larynx on his book of Historia Animalia. Uh, as far as history of uh, tracheostomy is concerned, Alexander the Great, uh, I mean, historians wrote about Alexander uh, the Great uh, doing tracheostomy. Uh, one of his soldiers was suffering from a pervious obstruction from trauma and he pierced the windpipe, which Aristotle described it as a windpipe. Uh, probably that's the cricothyroid membrane above the cricoid. So he did uh, that opening, so uh, using, uh, uh, using his uh, just, just the arrow that he held and finally uh, the patient was saved. I mean the, the, the soldier was saved. And this was documented by I many historians. Uh, there is one document uh, which is called uh, Suchuruta Samhita. It's an Indian document. It is I mean on the document we have seen we see different uh, Instruments here. Among the instruments, there were tubular instruments to excise nasal polyposis and to tonsillectomy. So we we can imagine how and I mean this is affecting the ear, nose, throat, and generally the head and neck, head and neck areas uh, were being dealt uh, early earlier in history. Uh, 
uh, concerning history in Ethiopia, uh, ENT was started first at Dagmai Manili Hospital by Russian doctors. Uh, they were practicing ENT first in Dagmai Manili. And, uh, even just will come to the uh, the name Yang Tepelai, how it is started there. So the misnomer emerged at Dagmai Manili Hospital where ENT was practiced, practiced first. Uh, but I mean, through time, uh, other institutions started to uh, practice ENT. At St. Paul Hospital, first there were Chinese doctors, followed by two Ethiopian medical doctors graduated from Cuba. In the Royal Hospital, there were about three ENT surgeons practicing ENT there. Actually, there was a very good ENT practice, uh, especially during the Derg regime and after that. At Yekati 12 Hospital, there were three ENT doctors uh, practicing ENT. In Rasdesta Hospital, uh, there, is, there was still a foreigner working uh, there, uh, an expat ENT surgeon. And in Blackline Hospital in the pediatric department, there was one ENT surgeon. So uh, it was only this, uh, only these setups were giving ENT care for the whole country. Um, but ENT uh, covers 30 to 50% of patients which are seen as primary uh, physicians, especially uh, just in, pedi in pediatrics, in uh, medical uh, OPDs and in family medicine practice. We see lots of ENT cases, uh, but the, despite this significant number of ENT cases, only limited number of ENT surgeons were there until recently, and only few of uh, these uh, hospitals uh, in the country were practicing ENT. There were, were some, there were some non-governmental and private organizations giving some uh, ENT services. Among the non governmental hospital, McGuire Senna Hospital uh, is mentioned as first. Uh, the NT service there was uh, good, and I mean, they have given the service for many of the patients when the service was not available in other places. Here, <clears throat> we cannot pass without mentioning the role of Addis Ababa University. So, Addis Ababa University uh, formed the department of ENT and the first residency program was started in 2008. So there were only a handful of ENT surgeons before this year, and only after that the significant number, the increment in the number of ENT surgeons has come. So after this residency program, I mean, the residents which have graduated from Addis Ababa University have formed a good ENT service at different uh, universities and uh, some of them have started their residency programs. Currently, there are three residency programs uh, uh, for ENT at Addis Ababa University, St. Paul Hospital Med Millennium Medical College, and Bardar University. ENT is currently given us a four year uh, program. Uh, concerning the nomenclature of uh, ENT, like this is a clinical discipline which deals with pathologies affecting the head and neck area. So uh, it used to be called an ENT or ear nose throat medicine or ear nose throat simply. And physicians practicing ENT are called ENT doctors. Uh, otolaryngology, it refers to ENT, uh, but formally it should be called otorinolaryngology, like ear nose throat in uh, Latin. Otto means ear, reno is nos, uh, laryngology, larynx is like the throat, so otorinolaryngology is the term. But the proper terminology for, the, the, for this discipline is otorinolaryngology, head and neck surgery. So uh, this is a proper nomenclature, but to make it short and for the sake of communication, people used to say simply anti or otolaryngology, but the formal name of the discipline is otorinolaryngology, head and neck surgery. So it's known as young at Ballet Kemena in, in our country. Uh, as anti service started in Menelik uh, in, in Menelik in Menelik Hospital, 
by the Russians, they were translators and they were translating for different physicians. And they asked one of the physicians, what are you treating? And he said, ear, nose, throat, and he was just telling them he can also treat some other parts in this region. And finally, they, they just simply said, oh, just let's say it young at Balai. And that's how it is started. And we believe that this is a misnomer because in the Department of Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, pathologies of the neck are strictly treated. And uh, also there are, uh, there are areas which are not covered uh, in the discipline by just being above the neck. So just the, the, just the name Young at Balai might include neurology, dentistry, ophthalmology, and, and so on. So, uh, but the proper terminology is otorhinolaryngology, head and neck surgery. Concerning the, uh, the, the, the discipline, it's both a medical uh, and a surgical discipline. Uh, there are a variety of cases that we see. So there are so many conditions which are treated medically, and uh, there are conditions which are treated surgery by, by surgery as uh, the first treatment modality or when medical treatment fails. We treat both pediatric and adult patients, and we treat both male and female. As you can see, the patient variety is very, very, very just uh, big, and uh, we have also a huge number of uh, case varieties. We deal with uh, special senses apart from the eye, and uh, we 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 we, need, we collaborate with other departments uh, because the area head and neck is closely uh, related with other regions. So we collaborate with uh, neurosurgeons, we collaborate with cardiothoracic surgeons, uh, we collaborate with dentists, and so on. So the area is very delicate. This is a place where the neurovascular structures are densely located and any injury uh, to, to these structures might end up uh, to a significant functional or aesthetic uh, loss. Uh, so it's a very delicate uh, area. And the area is also very complex. So it's uh, part of the body uh, where where lots of neurovascular structures are located in a very small area. And it is uh, very challenging also to deal with uh, pathologies in this area. Uh, for, grossly, we do have seven subspecialties in the discipline, otology, neurotology, and skull base surgery as categorized as one. Rhinology and anterior skull base surgery is another uh, area of subspeciality. Laryngology, uh, head and neck surgery, pediatric otolaryngology, facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, and allergies are the uh, seven uh, major areas of subspecialties. Here we left audiology because audiology, audiology uh, it needs a proper training first. I mean, we don't go from ENT to audiology, but audiology is part of ENT. But for someone to be an audiologist, there is a requirement to pass through uh, different trainings. So our scope of practice is like we practice from dura to plura with, uh, col by collaborating with other uh, disciplines also. So pathologists, they will not be limited to the neck. So just when they cross to the thorax, we work uh, in collaboration with cardiothoracic surgeons. When uh, sinonasal malignancies reach the skull base and uh, uh, have intracranial extension, we collaborate with uh, neurosurgeons, we collaborate with vascular surgeons, we collaborate with uh, uh, plastic and reconstructive surgeons. So uh, just this is the same. We, we, the, our, our region uh, extends from the skull base to, to the clavicle. Uh, so, but it's not our practice does not limit it to the head and neck area. We might go to uh, other areas for harvesting tissue in reconstructive surgery. So after ablating uh, many head and neck tumors, we leave a big area uh, so that to restore uh, the function and uh, uh, the structural 
uh, integrity of the, the body, I mean the head and neck area, we might harvest uh, some tissue. So we might go to the limb to harvest the uh, fibular free lab. And uh, we might go to uh, still the lower limb to harvest the uh, anterior lateral uh, tie flap. Um, that's how we, we, we reconstruct. For instance, after uh, removing ameloblastoma, so there will be a loss of uh, some part of mandible and it should be reconstructed. So for that purpose, we might harvest fibula for reconstructing the mandible. So this uh, is about the scope of the practice. We will try to see uh, how our current status in terms of diagnosis and treatment is. Um, NT has seen a significant progress in, in, in Ethiopia over the past five years. Uh, we, just, we will see how, how, how it happens. Like if you go like five or six years back and if you see the current practice, you will see a very significant difference. Uh, one is like diagnostic tests which are currently available were not available some five, six years back. So nasal endoscopy uh, is uh, it's a very important diagnostic test that we use uh, daily. Uh, it's uh, used to diagnose uh, any disease which affects the nose and uh, paranasal sinus, uh, to diagnose source of bleeding in epistaxis. You know, just we have to classify whether the epistaxis is anterior or posterior, uh, which help us in the management. So. Uh, just we, we can see the bleeding uh, vessel uh, using nasal endoscopy in a patient who comes with active bleeding from the nose. To assess response of uh, treatment, like after we treat some sinonasal pathologies by medical or surgical means, we can assess the response by using nasal endoscopy. If there is like hypertrophy of turbinate, and if we treat medically or surgically, we can we can follow and check by using nasal endoscopy. It is also used to take a precise biopsy from the nose and the nasopharyngeal area. So uh, it's a very important diagnostic tool. And the other uh, diagnostic test that we do uh, is bronchoscopy. So, uh, you know, there are uh, rigid and flexible bronchoscope. What we use, what we practice and do is uh, rigid bronchoscope. It has both diagnostic and therapeutic significance. Uh, so the diagnostic purpose of bronchoscope in our unit is to find out the cause of wheezing when we can't explain and to, cause, to, to know the cause of hemoptysis or unexplained cough persisting for more than four weeks should be evaluated with uh, rigid bronchoscope to rule out foreign body aspirations. Sometimes we might see some uh, vague findings on chest X-ray and if we are really suspicious about foreign body aspiration. So it's uh, very helpful uh, to do rigid bronchoscope and rule out the possibility of foreign body. Uh, when there are collection of brinkal secretion in comatose patients and in uh, uh, patients who has stayed in, uh, who has uh, uh, stayed uh, in ICU for a long time and especially after discharge when they have too much bronchial secretion, a bron rigid bronchoscope can help us uh, to, to collect, I mean, to, uh, to clear the bronchial secretion. But not only that, sometimes we might need for diagnostic purposes. So we might subject the uh, bronchial secretion for tests. So for that purpose, it's also helpful. It has also therapeutic significance, like foreign body uh, aspirations. It happens both in adults and pediatric uh, population, but it's very common among the pediatric uh, population. And uh, we routinely do rigid bronchoscope to remove aspirated foreign bodies from the bronchus. Um, we also uh, do rigid bronchoscope to remove retained mucus plug. Flexible endoscope, it's also a very important tool, uh, especially any patient who complains uh, hoarseness of voice for more than 
two weeks without any change despite our treatment should be sent to EMT and need to have evaluation by a uh, flexible laryngoscope. Here I will show you uh, a, a video of a flexible endoscope. So you put the scope in the nose, you can see the nasal cavity and if there is any pathology in the nose, you can see the nasopharynx and we can see the oropharynx from the posterior aspect and we can uh, also see the nerves and the hypopharynx during this examination. So here is a flexible examination. So it's in the right nose. So this is the nasopharynx. This patient has a torn one cyst. Actually, we, 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 we excised it yesterday. So this is the torn one cyst in the nasopharynx. And now what you see is the oropharynx. Video is not playing. Oh. Sorry for the inconvenience, I couldn't play the video. So uh, it's an important tool in uh, examining especially the, the larynx and the hypopharynx. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to appreciate, uh, to appreciate pathologies in this region. Okay, so uh, we do have uh, uh, esophago esophagoscopy. Uh, normally, just there is a rigid esophagoscopic examination, flexible fiber optic esophagoscopic examination, and transnasal esophagoscopic examination. Uh, we practically do rigid esophagoscopy and transnasal esophagoscopy. Flexible fiber optic esophagoscopy is uh, usually done by gastroenterologists. That's uh, the usual one. We do rigid esophagoscopy for different diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. Uh, just to investigate any patient who presented with uh, dysphagia. And sometimes when we want to know the cause of hemoptysis uh, and when we want to check uh, the, the esophagus for secondary uh, workup. You know, patient is sometimes present with a neck mass, uh, which is a neck uh, swelling, which turned out to be uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, then we may not be able to see the primary. So secondary in the neck might be investigated with pan endoscopy and as part of that uh, pan endoscopy, esophagoscopy uh, is uh, done, the rigid esophagoscopy. Therapeutically, it is important for removal of foreign body. In case of esophageal structure, uh, dilation can be, can be done using uh, esophag rigid esophagoscope. Uh, sometimes it's possible uh, to remove benign lesions and uh, in, palliation, in palliative care, we can put stent which uh, help us in uh, uh, dysphagia for especially advanced esophageal cancers using rigid uh, esophagoscopy. And the other uh, thing is transnasal esophagoscopy. Uh, this, this esophagoscopic examination is a flexible uh, esophagoscopic examination. Unlike the usual fiber optic flexible esophagoscopy, uh, this one 
is introduced through the nose, not through the mouth. And the patient doesn't need to be on left lateral equipus position. Rather, we can examine while the patient is in sitting position. And uh, we can uh, examine the whole esophagus up to uh, the fundus of the stomach. The indications for transnasal uh, esophagoscopy are in this, uh, dysphagia. Uh, sometimes as part of pan endoscopy, uh, we want to do uh, this esophagoscopy. As I have said, uh, we do for different reasons. Sometimes we might have secondary in the neck. Sometimes we might have a primary tumor, uh, let's say in the nasopharynx. And if we think, uh, there might be a second primary in other area we have to do uh, pan endoscopy. There is a concept of field cancerization. So the risk for hypopharyngeal cancer is similar to the risk for esophageal cancer. So if someone develop, develops hypopharyngeal cancer, so there, the possibility of developing for, uh, esophageal cancer is also high. For that reason, pan endoscopy is recommended in uh, tumors of the head and the neck. So as part of my uh, rigid endoscope, but uh, flexible transnasal esophagoscope is also uh, possible. And since it is done uh, at office setup, it's, uh, we don't need to take the patient to operation theater. So it's very cheap and uh, uh, less risky. To remove a small foreign bodies, foreign bodies from the esophagus, it really helps us and uh, to perform tracheosophageal puncture, especially after uh, total laryngectomy, where we remove the whole larynx for treating uh, advanced laryngeal cancers. We, we, we try a communication between the esophagus and the larynx uh, so that the patient uh, will be able to, to, to speak again. The procedure makes them uh, aphonic, but uh, making tracheosophageal puncture and putting uh, a speech valve in it helps the patient uh, to regain uh, his speech. Uh, sometimes we use it for taking laryngeal biopsy, but this is tricky and it should be uh, just we should take care when we do uh, laryngeal biopsy using transnasal esophagoscopy as. Uh, Sometimes the bleeding might stop and the patient might aspire it, or sometimes the patient might develop spasm. So we uh, just we, we should be very cautious. But it's possible to take a laryngeal biopsy, especially on uh, big masses. We can we can take biopsy. So. Uh, this mentioned uh, diagnostic tests are currently uh, uh, being done routinely in, in, in setups like uh, like Lyme, Yakati, and St. Paul. Uh, just five years or six years back, as I have said, uh, we, may not, we may not be able to, to see these things being practiced in the discipline of EMT, but currently it's a routine and uh, it has really uh, changed the care of the patients. The current practices in uh, otology include uh, my ringotomy. I mean, some of the procedures are very common and they were being used and they were being done for a long time. And some of the procedures are really being done uh, in, in a very nice way uh, recently. So uh, miringotomy, this is like an incision of the tympanic membrane. Uh, it can be done in acute uh, settings on acute acute media when it doesn't respond for antibiotic treatment uh, for more than 48 hours, or sometimes it's done on uh, long-standing middle effusion to treat uh, the media with effusion. Uh, miringotomy and uh, chromatic insertion is done, and it's it, it, it's a routine. Uh, tympanoplasty. There are five types of tympanoplasty, and in the past, only type one tympanoplasty was being uh, practiced, uh, which is repairing the tympanic membrane. But most pathologists doesn't end up by only perforating the tympanic membrane. Most patients they do have an 
an issue, ossicular issue. They might have uh, a lost ossicle or they might have a cholesteatoma. It's a kind of, uh, a kind of sac which is uh, found in the middle here. In, in, in the long run, it erodes the uh, uh, ossicles and finally it erodes the inner ear and the, the tegment which separates the ear from uh, the, the brain. So uh, there might be called steatoma. So it needs to be removed during the procedure. So sometimes like uh, we may not be able to do only uh, tympan of, uh, the repair of the, the eardrum. So we need to, 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 to explore the middle ear. So for that, we have to advance the, the, the tympanoplasty. And currently, uh, tympanoplasty has uh, really uh, being advanced and uh, we do up to type five uh, tympanoplasty. And uh, if there is in case like uh, loss of incas, interposition grafts are being used and but still there are some progresses uh, that, that, that we need to make. Uh, actually, that's because some uh, materials are not available. So uh, reconstructing the ossicles using uh, prosthesis is not uh, being practiced well. But uh, usually, like if there is a problem in the incus, we can take it out and we can modify it and put it back. Uh, and we can also put sometimes some grafts in between ossicles to maintain the ossicular integrity. Stepidectomy, we may not just, uh, we didn't think it like some, some years back in, but now uh, just it's doable. And uh, we do not only, I mean, in the past, we used to do only cortical mastoidectomy, but now we can do a uh, radical mastoidectomy, canal wall down, and uh, uh, just we, we, we can do uh, an advanced and advanced procedures like when the pathology uh, extends beyond the middle ear, it's now uh, doable and manageable in our setup. We we do myoplasty uh, in case of uh, arthritic external ear canal and uh, lateral skull based surgery, especially now uh, it is uh, glomus tumor, which, which is a vascular tumor uh, at, at the at the skull base is being managed uh, in our uh, in our setup in our department so it, it's a routine now to remove uh, these vascular tumors which are uh, called glomus tumors in rhinology uh, we have seen significant uh, advances uh, in the past when i say in the past past it's not very far by the way uh, i'm talking about the five, six years back. So uh, polypectomy was a procedure being done for nasal polyposis. Uh, but now we have moved to the standard procedure, which is called FES. FES stands for Functional Endoscopic Sinus Surgery. This is uh, a completely endoscopic uh, procedure. Uh, and we don't put any incision uh, on the patient without making any incision on the face of the patient we can access all the sinuses using endoscope. So the indications for functional endoscopic sinus surgery are chronic bacterial uh, sinusitis, which doesn't respond for medical treatment. Uh, recurrent acute bacterial sinusitis can be treated with functional endoscopic sinus surgery. In these cases, we, we, we go to, uh, to the, the, the nasal cavities and the opening of the sinuses will be dealt. So most of the time, uh, the pathology occurs when the uh, opening of the sinus uh, has a problem. So the, the main goal of functional endoscopic sinus surgery is making adequate opening of the sinuses, and the, uh, we call it a meatus uh, or ostium. And we have to just uh, open this uh, sinus as well so that the medications can reach to, to, to the sinuses and uh, the patient will respond as easily for medical treatment even after, after that. So uh, recurrent acute bacterial sinusitis uh, can be addressed uh, uh, with uh, functional scopic sinus surgery. 
Uh, rhinosinusitis with extensive polyposis can also be addressed with uh, phase. Fungal sinusitis with fungal or nasal polypi can be uh, addressed. Anthropoanal polyp, mycocele, uh, not only the pathologies, sometimes uh, epixas, epistaxis might be very difficult to control, especially the posterior epistaxis, which uh, arises from sphenopalatine artery. Uh, it's very difficult to control. Um, in that case, endoscopically, uh, it, it, it can be like sphenopalatine artery can be ligated, but their uh, epi, I mean, cauterization can also be done at first before ligating the, the artery. So cauterization of the bleeding site uh, can be done uh, endoscopically in epistaxis. Removal of foreign bodies from the nose and sinuses can be done uh, with uh, endoscopical and in septoplasty can be done uh, endoscopically. Uh, advanced nasal endoscopic techniques are used to remove tumors in the nose, like uh, inverted papilloma. <clears throat> we can also do medial maxillectomy, where we remove the medial wall of. Uh, the sinus in the lateral wall of the nose. Orbital abscess can be managed uh, endoscopically. We can go through the nose into the ethmoid sinus and finally uh, reach uh, the orbit uh, through the lamina papyracea. Uh, Ducrosis torinostomy can be done endoscopically. When there is SF leak in the anterior skull base, it can be addressed endoscopically oh. very successfully. Uh, uh, in, in pituitary surgery, actually, this is done in collaboration with neurosurgeons. Endoscopic uh, excision of pituitary uh, adenoma can be done endoscopically. We can go to the uh, sphenoid sinus, we break the anterior and posterior walls, and finally, we expose the dura and give it to the neurosurgeon so that they can remove it uh, easily. Optic nerve decompression Sorry, can be. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So optic nerve decompression uh, uh, can be done endoscopically. Um, and especially this, this uh, I mean, uh, ophthalmic uh, uh, conditions can be addressed uh, with uh, endoscopic intervention. Control of posterior epistaxis, as I have said, uh, can be done endoscopically. Uh, ligation of the sphenopalatine artery can be done. Quanal atresia, uh, even a few years back, it was being done uh, blindly, but now we are doing quanal atresia uh, using endoscopic techniques. So to mention some cases, like this is a patient who, who who had uh, a very advanced fungal rhinosinusitis, who is uh, managed uh, in our unit. I think the patient was managed at Yakati Tasrolet, where uh, Black Lines residency is being run. So uh, just this, this was very, very, very advanced case, and it was comfortably managed both by endoscopic and uh, open uh, techniques. Here on this picture, you, you can see lateral rhinotomy. Actually, that's Weber Ferguson incision uh, done. And the surgeon here, I think it's Dr. Dawit, is uh, looking just inside endoscopically and doing some endoscopic stuff. Uh, in head and neck surgery, we are dealing with almost all head and neck uh, malignancies. Uh, and we not only do ablative surgery, we reconstruct uh, the, 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 the defects. So head and neck surgery with reconstruction uh, is being done. Just to mention uh, some of uh, the key uh, procedures that we are currently doing. Maxillectomy of different types, man mandibulectomy, glossectomy, maxillary swing, laryngectomy, neck dissections, thyroidectomies, and so many other head and neck procedures are being done uh, currently. 
So just let's see uh, uh, two cases. Uh, this patient presented to uh, a Yakatit 12 hospital. She is a 54 years old uh, female patient who had tongue CA removed some two years back. But now she presented with advanced uh, tongue CA, which involved the mandible. Then uh, we did thorough evaluation and we did metastatic workup, chest x-rays was fine, abdominal ultrasound was unremarkable and she didn't have any symptom. And the, finally, uh, the patient consented for surgery. What we did was hemiglossectomy, hemimandibulectomy, bilateral neck dissection, and reconstruction was done. So this, this is the, 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 the tumor. So this is a tongue, the tumor, this is a medial aspect of the mandible, whereas this is a lateral aspect. So here you see is a mandible, the condylar process and the coronary process. Here is a tumor, and here you see the last two molars, and the tumor engulfed the mandible both medially and laterally. So with, with very good margins, the tumor uh, was removed. So this is an intraoperative picture of uh, the patient here uh, is a defect. So with reconstruction and closure, this is a post-op picture of the patient after uh, one week. So this is the procedure done for uh, tongue CA. Recently, we had a 20-year-old uh, male patient presented with left side facial swelling. So the CT scan revealed uh, left side infratemporal fossa mass with the scalvis erosion and extension into the uh, intracranial cavity. But the dura was not eroded. The, the dura was not involved, but the mass uh, extended into the uh, intracranial uh, cavity. So uh, infratemporal fossa is a very challenging uh, anatomic area. Uh, it is situated just media to the mandible and uh, to access this area, you have to uh, just divide the mandible. Uh, here, we didn't break the mandible, we didn't just divide the mandible because the coronoid process, the condylar process was already pushed by the mass and it was out of the temporal mandibular joint. So uh, we just we just retracted laterally and we were able to access the infratemporal fossa. Uh, and as you can see here, here is the facial nerve. So we preserved the facial nerve and with all its branches, we have skeletonized all the branches of the facial nerve and we have uh, preserved other lower, cratia, lower cranial motor nerves. So intraoperatively, the skull bells was completely eroded. The foramen ovale and lacerum was not there, but the booting is uh, the nervous and uh, vascular structures were all preserved. So finally, and we have removed this tumor about 10 by 4 centimeter. So uh, not only uh, in these areas, we have seen some progress in, in, in uh, audiology. Uh, currently, I mean, in the past, audiometry was the only investigative mod modality that we were uh, Doing, but currently, especially in audiology, uh, St. Paul's are doing great. So tympanometry and speech uh, audiometry and all these tests are available. Not only that, uh, a newborn screening, I mean, newborn test is also possible and it's doable now, you know, now in, in the country. In St. Paul, uh, we, we have uh, this AVR and uh, any uh, hearing loss uh, in children can be uh, investigated. So here are my references. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Dawit, here is uh, uh, my, uh, my speech and we can discuss.
thank you, Dr. Masara, and it was a nice and insightful presentation. If participants have any question, you can unmute me yourself and you can ask me a question. Yeah, here I see uh, Mangala University also has anti head and neck surgery residency program in service. Yeah, uh, just one of uh, the pioneer in head, head and neck uh, uh, and anti head and neck surgery was anti. I mean Mangala uh, University. We know that uh, I, I just passed it because currently it's not uh, active. Otherwise, we know that there uh, is a good residency program there and the NTC service in Magale was also uh, very great. Okay, I have so one question. From Ibrahim now, what about the place of the uh, adjuvant treatment you know, in case of no advanced case? I just uh, rephrased the question. Yeah. So uh, just here is a challenge. Head and neck surgery uh, uh, needs to have adjuvant treatment. I mean, head and neck tumors, you cannot treat it uh, by surgery alone. You need to have adjuvant uh, uh, special radiation therapy. Uh, without uh, radiation therapy, head and neck surgery uh, might not be curative in all cases of head and neck malignancies. So this is really our challenge. But now uh, we are uh, trying uh, to just to work in collaboration with the Department of Oncology at uh, Al Sabah University, and we are scheduling patient tests earlier so that our patient tests get the adjuvant treatment earlier. You know, if the patient get uh, treatment after six weeks, they get all the side effects and complications without getting the benefit. So we are really working hard, uh, especially to, to form a good uh, collaboration with uh, uh, the Department of Oncology, actually. Uh, that's why we say it anti, uh, uh, just we, we work uh, in collaboration with other disciplines. And we normally head and neck malignancies need inter, uh, interdiscipline uh, involvement. Uh, so uh, we are trying to, to, to communicate first with uh, oncology unit and uh, we are trying to get our patients uh, and uh, we, are, we, we are communicating with them and they are getting as a adjuvant treatment uh, earlier. But this doesn't happen in all cases. This doesn't happen in all cases. We see uh, our patients coming with recurrence without getting radiation therapy. Uh, it, it, it's not uh, an easy thing to get uh, radiation here uh, in our setup. I have the uh, questions. What about the place of no, neonatal screening and was no with cochlear implant in you know, our setup? Since you raised you know, the issue of no neonatal screening. Yeah. So uh, 
there is uh, an ongoing study uh, about the pre. I mean, there is a hearing survey uh, being done uh, countrywide. Uh, neonatal screening, it's possible. I mean, I mean, it's doable currently, but with with the setup that we have, uh, we cannot reach uh, this, this this children. Normally, we need to have. Uh, screening programs. It might be universal or uh, we, we, we may need to have our policy, but we need to have a screening programs. If we detect children early and if we intervene with cochlear implantation, we could prevent uh, the disability in, in children. But this 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 is not uh, now being practical uh, because of different factors. It's not easy the, to get a cochlear implant. And uh, just the issue is, I mean, you know, it, it's very expensive. Uh, and when um, without cochlear implantation, at least uh, knowing is very important. But we need to have cochlear implantation on uh, screen on hearing screening in uh, in newborns. But uh, I mean, this 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 is the area where we need uh, to progress. Maybe Dr. David might say uh, something on this issue. Also. Yeah. Just to add to your point, you know that it's currently the only sense then that can the disability you know, can be managed now with implanted. Even though now currently the issue of cost is not there now, but as within the layman term, you know, usually deafness you no know, 90% of them is uh, if it's early implanted, you know, it, it can be treated. So hopefully, you know, maybe from starting, you know, October, you know, we will have a constant, you know, uh, availability of cochlear implant, but the issue of cost, you know, will be there, you know, because it will be on the, possibly on the private setup. But I think, you know, it will be a major progress, you know, in the hearing care, you know, in our country. Yeah, uh, you know, cochlear implants are very expensive, but still those who can afford uh, should get it. And uh, technically, I think we do have uh, just enough uh, surgeons to do. Uh, but the issue, uh, as you have said, is just the cost. And uh, we, we, we will see, I think. Uh, once this cochlear implantation is available, it's it's a breakthrough. Uh, we said it was a, it was a breakthrough. The past five years is a breakthrough for ANT, and now uh, with cochlear implantation, just that's that, that, that's a great breakthrough. A related uh, issue we have which from Amamir, what the price of adenosine? To me, or I'm to select to me for a patient with adenoid hypertrophy with okay. normal tonsils. Okay, so uh, the size doesn't really matter. I mean, if, if you if we are strictly talking about adenoid hypertrophy, if the adenoid hypertrophied and causes obstruction which means uh, the child will have obstructive sleep apnea. The child will snore at sleep and uh, not only snoring, the problem comes when the patient starts to have cessation of breathing and like frequent sleep awakening. So that's called OSA. When the patient has OSA, uh, the adenoid should be managed. So we don't need to remove all adenoids. There is a medical management first, and if the, the child doesn't respond for the medical management, then uh, adenoidectomy will be done in a normal tonsil. I think the question is that way. Uh, a child having adenoid hypertrophy with normal tonsil. So in that case, uh, management. I mean, the American uh, uh, Pediatric Association recommends omethazone uh, for it, medical management for hypertrophy as a first line of treatment. And if it doesn't respond for that, we might go to adenoidectomy and relief of relief the symptom from the child. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I got the question now. So, if the if the child presented with symptoms of uh, of starting sleep apnea, and if the child has uh, adenoid hypertrophy with uh, normal tonsils, probably you are talking about tonsil grade zero or one. Uh, we need to do adenotonsillectomy or adenoidectomy. So if the child has only obstructive symptoms, there is no need to remove the tonsils, especially, I mean, if the child doesn't have recurrent uh, episodes of sore throat, we need to do only uh, adenoidectomy. So, uh, what in panostomy materials do you use in Ethiopia? We use uh, chromic uh, tubes. Uh, we we need to use tympanostomy tubes only uh, in, 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 in the field of uh, otitis media with effusion. In case of acute otitis media not responding uh, for medical treatment, we might do uh, tympanostomy alone. But uh, in managing middle reaffusion, we have to put this uh, this, this tubes and uh, uh, commonly available tube is a grommet. The other thing I think if I get the question also to add, only the obstructive sleep apnea is the absolute indication for adenosis lectomy. But if there is no, as Dr. Masala said, you know, if there is no uh, hypertrophic fibre tonsillectomy, there is no place for prophylactic tonsillectomy. We can say it like that. Yeah, thank you. If anyone can have a question, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Okay, I think the... Yeah, I think the, I see a comment a comment yeah. which says uh, the, the, the most physicians in our country are not aware of the vast department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, most of the cases uh, being managed by primary health care providers are ANT cases. Normally, ANT cases cover 30 to 50 percent of outpatient uh, cases in. In, 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 in a primary uh, care setup. So uh, just when you see the time given during undergraduate study, uh, it's not proportional. You know, uh, uh, just we do have two to four weeks of anti attachment. Then when you practice as a general practitioner, you see lots of anti cases. And just it, 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 it doesn't go anywhere. I mean, we have said it uh, a lot and we have said it so many times. We need to revise our undergraduate curriculum. It should be uh, market oriented, which means uh, we need to produce a physician which the community or the market demands. So in the community, uh, we have to see the epidemiology of uh, the diseases and uh, epidemiologically, uh, the prevalence of NT cases is very, very significant. And uh, I think just we, we, we will uh, continue pushing uh, the responsible, uh, I mean, pushing this to the responsible bodies, especially to revise our undergraduate curriculum. Okay. 
the other uh, commenters with respect to the program. I think many people know. Initially, it was scheduled on I think for 3 p.m. Sorry for the misunderstanding, but we already talked you know, with the thematic group, and they will replay you know, the video, and you can take you know, the survey questions and the certificate. You know, we 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 are very no accordingly. So I will drop the the survey question link to the chat box and for uh, we need to know we can take you know, the last two questions possibly if there is Okay, so maybe the last one no, from Nardos. So ANP has come now to paraphrase the question now. How do you see now the future of ANP in Ethiopia? Yeah, so I think we, we with an enthusiastic uh, young uh, anti-surgeons and uh, with the continuous availability of uh, the equipment, which are very important for the development of entity, we, we can proceed, I mean, we can keep the momentum. Uh, you know, one of the game changing uh, in the development of entity, I think is, uh, the purchase of that huge anti-medical equipment by St. Paul in 2016 and its distribution to other centers. The, the impact is, is not easy, but not, not only the, 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 the equipment, uh, the enthusiastic young anti-surgeons, especially in uh, 2018 and afterwards, the, 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 I mean, we need to give credit for those enthusiastic uh, uh, MT and head and neck surgeons who has really uh, made most of the procedures being then possible. So uh, now with the studying uh, being continued, we can see a huge, huge uh, progress in, in the coming few years, I think. Yeah. So I, th uh, I think there is a question by Nehret, who says, is there a fellowship program in the field of otolaryngology in the country? What about the future? Right now, we don't have active uh, fellowship program, especially we don't have uh, uh, a formal uh, fellowship program uh, in the department of uh, antibody in Addis Ababa University in St. Paul and uh, both in Bahadar and Makale, which are training uh, residents. But uh, in the near future, definitely we will start uh, uh, fellowships in uh, head and neck surgery first and uh, uh, so on. No. Dr. Daoud, maybe you can say, Something yeah, on this uh, possibly. Our plan will be to start you now with uh, in head and neck surgery and with collaboration with St. Paul. Now we can, it's we are interested you now to start you know, the rhinology and anterior skull based surgery. And within the new future, now we can start on autology and lateral skill based surgery, possibly. And I think you know, we are in the future, in, in the next five to 10 years, you know, we, we will be a hub now in MT and the endemic surgery, not only in the Ethiopia, I think you know, within the, the sub Saharan African country, we can still, you know, I think you know, we have you know, the chance you know, to be 
the hub for a and its surgery. So I think, you know, it's, if you have anything to say, otherwise, no, it's better not to wind up the presentation. We are grateful for you. Nice presentation and all of the participants. Please now fill your survey questions and anything left, Dr. Masel? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, know, all the participants and Dr. Masel for his nice presentation. Thank you and have a nice evening.